All right, welcome everybody. Uh, today it's a great pleasure to have uh, Dr. Alexandra Nils Ali. Uh, she's now a postdoc at Cornell with uh, Kirsten Pedersen. Um, she completed the PhD with uh, Steve Laval at ULUC. And uh, I should mention here, she's the co creator of the robot design game. Yeah, that's. <laughs> and, <laughs> that's true. Uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. And uh, she will talk about, uh, you know, the trade offs for designing uh, uh, robots. Um, and I think so we've seen um, a few other uh, uh, members of the Laval family in the previous talks. Uh, we have Jason once. And uh, so it, it's um, I really admire, you know, the total research direction about uh, a minimality or just trade offs, uh, seeing that you know what, what you can do uh, with, uh, with less. And I'm you know, sure today she will convince us that less is actually more. Yes, thank you, Andrea, and thank you, uh, everybody, for inviting me. And um, <clears throat> I'm very excited to get started. So let's jump into it. So, um, yeah, since I'm not there in person, I'll give you a few different pictures so you can estimate. <laughs> Uh, what I look like. Uh, I just finished my PhD. It feels like I just finished uh, last fall with Steve. So I was his last American student and now he's happily uh, doing stuff in Finland closer to you all. Um, so I grew up in Colorado, went to undergraduate uh, education there. So we have some pretty okay mountains there. I think uh, I've never been to Switzerland, so I won't compare the Alps to the Rockies uh, until I get a chance to visit. Uh, and now I'm, I'm very happily uh, a postdoc in Kirsten Peterson's lab at Cornell. Uh, so I just got back uh, on Saturday from a two week visit there. So I got to see their, their waterfalls and uh, it's quite beautiful. I don't have a picture of myself in Illinois because it's, it's just sort of a very flat state with a lot of corn. <laughs> uh, so this is a picture of me in Finland here in the middle. Um, so yeah, today I'll be talking about minimalism, especially some practical examples and trying to convince you that it's uh, worth thinking about. I'll talk a little bit about embodied intelligence. I'll talk about my thesis research, which was mostly on modeling and motion planning for what we call deliberate boundary interactions. So robots that bump into stuff. Uh, and I'll talk about some considerations and thoughts I've been having about automated design and how to really formalize and concretize all of these ideas. So you can imagine a spectrum of robots from something with a really large brain, uh, keeping track of everything, its own personal state in the environment, a complete high fidelity map, um, its past trajectory through the space. And that's kind of one end of the spectrum. And then all the way on the other end of the spectrum, you could have uh, the tiniest brain possible where maybe a robot just keeps track of whether or not it's, it's hitting something in the environment, uh, colliding with something in the environment. So I'll be talking about things mostly on, on the minimal side of that spectrum. Uh, so we might ask ourselves, when is minimalism practical uh, instead of just an interesting theoretical problem? So when we want to reduce cost or power consumption, this could be with consumer goods. So we were talking about the vacuum cleaning robots, maybe the most successful com commercial robot ever um, put out there for, for consumers. Um, they can do all sorts of other things too, besides vacuuming, uh, lawn mowing, pool cleaning, those kinds of very important tasks. Um, what I've become really interested in, in the last few years is, is coming up with persistent agents in remote or challenging environments. So situations where you might not be able to recharge your battery all the time, you want to be able to persist in the environment for a long time. So you want to have minimal power consumption, um, but still be robust. So the, a really good example of this, I think, is the drifters. Um, a lot of people are working on the drifters now. They're these little floating robots. You can put them in the ocean. Sometimes they don't even have any actuation. They just have maybe a GPS and some sensors, and they just drift passively on the currents. Um, but they can also be active, so they can move up and down in the water column and use different uh, parts of the flow field in the ocean to navigate. So I think these kinds of designs are, are super interesting. Um, of course, as we shrink robots down, uh, the scale makes certain kinds of technology that we use uh, for big brain robots impossible. So cameras can only become so small, although they're getting smaller every day. Um, 
and maybe there's not even enough uh, space, memory space on your chip to store a high fidelity model. Um, so I ran into this for the first time when I was working uh, with a company called Petronix, making a small robot cat toy. So it's a little robot mouse, and it was just too small to have a, a camera on it. Um, and it would have drained the battery immediately <laughs> as well. So then uh, the third place is when we're designing for robustness. So this is a little, you can argue about this, but um, in my mind, having fewer moving parts on your robot, whether that's in software or hardware, can help you verify the performance more easily. Um, you know, in the, in the limit, you just have a, a rock or a robot that just sits there and it's not moving at all, you know what it does. Uh, so you can argue about the, the usefulness of verifying very, very simple robots, but you can't argue that it is easier. <laughs> Uh, and then in grad school, of course, I, I worked on these boundary interactions. So uh, both in these minimalist applications I just mentioned and in others, there's tons of boundaries in the real world. Um, you could argue it's basically most of what we do in robotics is worrying about when the robot's interacting with some boundary of its space. So I'll define a boundary interaction as when a robot makes either physical uh, or virtual contact with the boundary of its configuration space. So there's some point where it can't go any further for whatever reason. Uh, some examples, of course, the, the vacuuming robots bumping into the wall. Um, with the lawn mowing robots, they, they actually bury wires and you can um, keep certain parts of your, your golf course or whatever safe, keep it from falling in the lake. Uh, if you have a robot with a visual system, even a high level one, maybe there's some point where you're going to lose sight of all of your landmarks that you're using to do, to do visual tracking. And so you don't want to go past that point. <clears throat> so that induces a boundary in your environment. Um, and you have to decide what to do when you reach that point where you can't see any of your landmarks. Uh, and of course, any form of object manipulation where you're actually interacting with something in the world and trying to move it around or, or construct something. Uh, in particular, especially in my postdoc, I've been thinking a lot about digging too. So uh, if you're a robot and you're digging or a termite uh, and you reach the end of a tunnel, that's, that's another interesting boundary interaction and you might actually be able to change the boundary um, at that point. So um, yes, we're, we're roboticists, we're scared of collisions, uh, especially if you're working on self-driving cars or something like that, we, we don't want a collision. Um, but of course, there are some types of robots that um, can handle it, and it can actually become much more efficient. So uh, Steve and um, Lawrence published this in 2013 before I started grad school. Um, but this, this short little paper kind of got me started on my PhD track. Um, and they started uh, an analyzing these kinds of boundary interactions on a very abstract level. Um, on a more practical level, you can do interesting things like localization or task assignment just through inter-robot collisions. So robot to robot collisions are also very interesting and I think also a form of boundary interaction if the robots can't move through each other or climb on top of each other. <laughs> um, a lab at UC Riverside has also been doing a lot of really interesting stuff with more traditional motion planning, but including collisions and showing that you can actually uh, become much faster at navigating a cluttered environment if you allow yourself to bump into objects sometimes. Um, and a lot of people have been doing this with drones and, and things as well. And then of course there's um, insects and animals use this all the time, constantly um, are, are making contact with their environment and using it to decide what to do. So um, our lab in Ithaca just hired another postdoc uh, named Paul Bardunius, who's like the termite king. Uh, he, he has done a lot of really interesting work on how termites uh, dig their tunnels, how they interact with uh, irregularities in the surface of their environment. So that's how they decide when to branch their tunnels, when to stop digging, when to widen their tunnels, things like that. Um, so this figure is from his paper that I've cited here. And they go through and actually analyze the, the scattering angles of the termites, which I think is really cool. Um, so the last piece of intro I'll go through is embodied intelligence. Um, so this term has become a lot more popular in the last few years, and it's pretty complicated um, to define formally. Um, but I think we all sort of have an intuitive idea of what it means. Uh, here's a, a really video that I love of a cone skateboarding. And I tried to learn how to skateboard last year. And I'll tell you that this cone is a lot better than I am. <laughs> um, 
So there's an interesting uh, amount of computation and, and stabilization and control that can be done just by the design of, of the body of uh, this cone in this case, but uh, with robots and, and um, anatomy in general. Um, when we compare robots to living beings, we see that uh, robots are vastly less capable in terms of um, external configuration. So this plot is from a paper by Amy Leviers, who um, finally got this, this out in the world. And I think she has a really, she's definitely thought more than almost anyone else about how to quantify these kinds of relative complexities. So here she's got a graph of different types of measurements of human degrees of freedom. Um, I think the x-axis is internal configuration. So that's like your computational internal states. And then the y-axis is your external configuration. So how many physical degrees of freedom you have. Um, so you can see that Roombas and these other vacuuming robots rank um, just a little bit above like tiny little worms <laughs> uh, and pretty much every other uh, living being is, is much more intelligent and at least capable um, of reaching many more configurations. So, uh, but what we're interested in is, is formalizing this and designing uh, robots that don't have to do all of the hard work in, in software, but maybe do more of it uh, physically in their bodies. Uh, okay, so my general research questions for my PhD and onward uh, can be summarized in three questions. Uh, so yes, formalizing, quantifying resources in the robot design problem, especially for these non-traditional designs. So Andrea and, and his collaborators have done a lot of really great work um, quantifying for sort of, um, traditional designs and, and where we have these big libraries of parts that we understand how they fit together and how to how to order them, uh, how to rank them. Uh, but in these new and uh, very exciting applications, sometimes the interactions can be quite uh, difficult to wrap our heads around. So I'm interested in all of these areas. Um, and then, of course, how can we integrate uh, all of this understanding of, of the embodied intelligence and also our geometric and dynamical understandings of the environment and how we interact with it uh, into robot design, as well as regular motion and task planning. Um, <clears throat> and then can you know we use this to actually apply to real tasks uh, and make them tractable. So I'm interested in things like scalable and robust control of, of many, many tiny robots. Um, and then of course, long-term deployment of these low powered agents in, in dynamic environments. So today I'll give a quick overview of my thesis work on bouncing robots and wild bodies. So these are kind of low level motion models uh, for boundary interactions. And we'll talk about uh, manipulation a little bit. Um, and then I'll give a highlight of my current work that I've been doing since January. So bouncing robots, uh, inspired of course by, by our favorite vacuuming robots. Uh, but it ends up that actually microorganisms do this as well. So here's a really nice figure from this paper. Um, ciliary contact interactions dominate surface scattering of swimming eukaryotes. So as these little cells, single-celled organisms swim around, um, their, their body morphology and their dynamics of their, of their cilia, their little swimmers, uh, interact with boundaries of the environment and cause them to scatter at particular angles that are not necessarily, they could be zero. Um, so they would do some wall following or they might peak at a slightly um, a different angle. So these are really interesting. Um, Jean-Luc Zafod up at um, Minnesota has been doing some really interesting work on the nonlinear non dynamics of these systems as well. So um, I found this really fascinating. Uh, and so my thesis work was mostly focused on coming up with a few different uh, classes of bounce rules, we called them. So uh, a strategy for what to do when you interact with a boundary. So the first class we came up with was fixed angles. So that was where if you swim into the wall or, or run into the wall, you leave at the same angle every single time. It doesn't matter um, what your prior state was. You have some way of aligning yourself to the wall and leaving at the same angle every single time. And that, that has a lot of interesting um, uh, resulting dynamics, which I'll show in a moment. But 
there's a few other interesting classes as well. So there's monotonic uh, bounce rules where you keep a little bit of your state from before. So you keep which direction you were headed in relative to, to the wall, um, but you still have this, this kind of fixed uh, relative angle to the wall. And then the final class is relative rotation. So that's where you don't know any data about the wall except for that you've hit it and then you rotate in your own internal reference frame um, and that one can obviously be achieved by a lot of different types of platforms. So in my thesis I went through and looked at these different classes, looked at the resulting dynamics, especially if we iterate the same boundary rule many times. So I'm interested in this because it's a step toward kind of global or um, constant control. So we, if we can get into a certain mode by just iterating the same rule, that requires a lot less state tracking than uh, trying to change your rule every single time you collide because there's a lot going on in these complicated, uh, crowded environments. So it ends up that when you iterate the same boundary interaction many times, uh, you do get up into, into very predictable patterns. Um, there's some pretty clear trapping regions, limit cycles. Um, so a lot of my thesis work was characterizing this in terms of the environment geometry. Um, if you want to read more about that, I would recommend you look at our, our IJRR paper. Um, but uh, one really cool thing about this work is there's actually a really nice simple contraction property. So this figure on the bottom right here, we take two points X and Y, which are on some linear edge of the environment. So from vertex I to vertex I plus one. Uh, and then we leave at some angle theta. So that's determined by our bounce rule. Uh, but if we leave from two points with the same rule, and then we look at uh, the distance between those two points when they're mapped onto the next edge of the environment, uh, if the distance between them decreases over that transition, then we call that a contraction, uh, a contracting transition. So we have a, a contraction rule. And then if you iterate uh, a dynamical system that has an overall contracting property, you'll end up in a limit cycle. Um, so there's some very uh, fundamental theorems that, that show that um, and you can characterize. Um, so then just given a sequence of bounce rules uh, and an environment uh, and a starting point, you can predict the existence, location, and stability of limit cycles uh, for really any series of bounce rules. Any, your environment doesn't even have to be polygonal. It could just, it just needs to be piecewise linear. Um, so this was really exciting. Uh, we were able to characterize a lot of the dynamics of what's going on with these, these bouncing systems. Um, figure out where the trapping regions would be and start applying these to more high level uh, applications. So I started thinking about motion planning. Um, I became really interested in non-deterministic motion planning because of course the first question people ask is you can't always get the robot to bounce at exactly the right angle. You know, if you have to always bounce at 32.37 degrees, uh, you're going to have a bad time. So I became interested in the non-deterministic motion planning problem where uh, we want to come up with a range of angles that if the robot bounces between anywhere in that range, it will, it will succeed in its task. Um, of course, you could apply um, also regular motion planning uh, problems to this, maybe not as easily to the non-deterministic version, but um, definitely to the deterministic version, you start asking like, okay, why don't you just use our RT? Why are you coming up with all these novel exact geometric motion planners? Um, and one big reason is that if you just apply a generic technique, um, you lose a lot of the, the geometric understanding of your environment. So in this figure, you can see if the robot was going to start out on this bottom edge, uh, its, its initial state is this gray region um, projected onto the edge, I guess. Uh, so it's, it's uh, you know, the robot is taking up maybe 80% of this edge and then through a sequence of bounces, it actually decreases the set of possible states that it could be in into a much smaller set. And then from there, it's able to bounce through a narrow gap in the environment, uh, even under non-determinism. So being able to really understand, you know, where are the transitions in your environment? Where are the, the narrow gaps um, and how can you, actively decrease uncertainty in your state through the motion process is, is really important. And it's something that you lose by just applying a, a point to point planner. So I'll give you a, a highlight of the technique. Um, 
basically what we did is we further discretized an environment. So given a polygon or some other environment, you can find points in the environment where what we call visibility events happen, where something that you couldn't see before becomes visible or something that you could see before disappears. Um, so imagine sliding along the, oops, sliding along the um, edge of this polygon. When you pass these purple points, uh, suddenly edges that you couldn't see before will become visible or invisible. Um, so that lets us augment uh, the environment and create a discrete transition graph where each of the nodes is one of these segments where there's sort of an equivalence class of what, what edges of the original polygon are visible. So that's pretty useful. And we can also annotate this graph with other um, information about you know the range of angles that allow that transition, which ones are stabilizing, which ones are contracting. Um, so I played around a lot with different uh, ways to search through this graph. Um, there's just an example here of kind of what that looks like, um, where like node zero in the graph is uh, the segment from zero to one uh, on the polygon. So the nice thing is when you do this graph search, it outputs not only your plan, your path um, through the space, but also a characterization of how much uncertainty is, is allowed uh, in order to execute that plan. So it almost becomes a design constraint. If you want to execute a certain uh, plan in your environment, you need a robot that can be uh, so, so precise and your, your planner will tell you that. So, um, Oops, I did not add the site. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, I did a really cool collaboration with um, Anna Pervin and Tommy Berueta, who are PhD students of Todd Murphy at Northwestern University. Um, we uh, were really interested in manipulating objects with bouncing robots. So we came up essentially with this motion primitive where the robot bounces in a triangle uh, in an infinitely long hallway with an object. Uh, and if it's able to execute this, this motion primitive you see here on the right, it will eventually push the object into the goal region. So it's a pretty, pretty simple cartoon um, of what's going on, but we see this as kind of a building block toward, toward more complex emergent manipulation. Um, so we defined all of these uh, motion primitives. I won't go into what all these are, but we basically had a set of six different actions and sensing uh, modalities that we could execute. So that's like rotating in place, moving forward, a set amount, um, detecting different chemicals. So, so this last row is we had just chemical blue and chemical yellow, uh, as long as you're able to distinguish uh, if one or the other or both of those is present, then uh, your robot will be able to execute our, our setup here. So we tried to make these motion primitives pretty generic and pretty inspired by micro robots, um, like what's actually possible at the small scale. Uh, and then we came up with these high level um, states that the robot could be in. So, you know, if you're pushing a box in an infinitely long hallway, you can be to the right of it, you could be to the left of it, you could be somewhere in the middle, this red area, um, or you could be actually uh, correctly executing your limit cycle that's pushing the box, uh, or you could be lost. So we basically here on the left, you have robot one with all of the sensors and actuators, but then as you take away sensors and actuators, we were able to actually formally characterize the uh, capabilities of that robot and also tell when and how it will get lost. So if you're a very tiny robot, uh, it's very important. It's very likely that you're going to get lost or stuck at some point. So this is, I became really interested in this problem, um, actually with the, the mouse robot, the cat toy robot, um, figuring out, you know, when will it get stuck in the couch? How do you distinguish uh, being stuck on, on some cables versus uh, the cat actually pinning you down with very limited sensing? Um, so I think this problem of, of at least being able to identify when you're lost or how often you'll get lost uh, is really important for these kinds of systems that I'm talking about. And we simulated these, unfortunately have not found somebody to actually implement it at the micro scale. Uh, but we simulated this with some noise and some, some random initial conditions and just showed that um, just by kind of plopping all these robots down into the environment, you're able to push the box uh, pretty robustly. So you can check out our wafer paper for more on that. Uh, and that's the end of bouncing robots. So if there's any questions on that, I'm happy to take them.
Otherwise, I'll start talking about uh, another motion model. So if you have questions, just feel free to unmute. I'm talking to the audience. OK. Um, so when we're talking about the micro scale, of course, we can't ignore um, how most things move at the micro scale, which is more of a Brownian motion rather than this, this straight line ballistic motion that you've been seeing with bouncing robots. So I became really interested in Janus particles and all these other kinds of micro scale particles that people have been uh, developing on the material science side. Um, they have some really interesting and useful properties that almost all of them have. Um, almost all of them are able to, to do some sort of clustering, either from dynamic, um, so that's this picture up here on the top left. So just by the way they're pushing, they're in a stable dynamic configuration. Um, of course, you can have mechanical or electromagnetic interactions. They do some kind of active random walk. It might not be perfectly Brownian. They might also have some self-propulsion, um, but we can characterize it. And then they, of course, interact with the environment. They, they bump into things. So they're very exciting. Uh, oh, no, this video broke. Uh, but there's actually a video on the ETH uh, materials department website that has a really nice uh, video of how these particles move. Uh, but there's some here on the, on the right here as well. And this one's really interesting because by changing just the concentration of um, the fluid, of hydrogen peroxide in the fluid that they're swimming in, you can dramatically change their motion profile. So these, these particles are really interesting. Um, they have a lot of capabilities, but we're not quite sure how to design them to do useful things yet. Uh, so in Steve's lab, before I ever came, uh, they were investigating this platform called Weasel Balls, which is, I have one here if you want to see inside of them, but there's just a, a little motor inside of them that spins at a constant frequency, more or less. And, um, they just roll around. So they're, they're a nice model of what we call wild bodies, which are any sort of body or, or agent that is guaranteed to eventually cover the entire space, you know, strike every open set. Um, so they're, they're nice, they're cheap, um, they're, they're fun. <laughs> uh, you can do a lot of interesting experiments with them. Uh, so Leonardo Bobadilla did, did his thesis on these and had a lot of, of work before I showed up. And I'm really interested in them because they're a nice sort of toy model of this resource constraint sensing and actuation that I've been talking about. So um, they've done some experiments with laser beams, where if you cross the laser beam, you know, your system detects it or the, the agent itself will detect. Uh, so that could be a virtual boundary. It could also be an analog of um, what at the micro scale they call chemical comparators. So that's where you're able to detect um, whether there's more of chemical A or B in, in your local environment. And if you have two chemical sources, then the point where your chemical comparator output switches over uh, defines whatever boundary there is between those two sources. Um, so it's sort of a natural way to discretize the environment uh, with very, very minimal sensing. Uh, of course, you can play around with how they interact with the wall, um, angle alignment. They could have me mechanical interactions based on their own shape, um, or you can add hubs to them, which I'll show in a moment. Um, you could, of course, come up with some kind of complicated uh, feedback control mechanism on the hub to align, or you could just play with, with how it mechanically interacts. Uh, you can put clocks and all sorts of different sensors on them. Uh, and yeah, so what I'll, I'll highlight here is that many, many common sensors can induce like a coarse discretization of the workspace. So especially low fidelity sensors. So if you have a camera, technically it does discretize the workspace because every position you put the camera in will have a different, a different um, output and you can distinguish different points from each other. But if you just have a sensor that tells you I'm an inch away from the wall, uh, then all points in the workspace that are an inch away from the wall become the same to the robot. So that's kind of the type of reasoning we're, we're talking about here. And there's some citations for these. Um, they've done a lot of different things with control, controlling the distribution of these agents through the environment, counting them, tracking them, um, really, really interesting stuff. So I worked on a project with some undergraduates at UAUC where we were looking at self-assembly um, with these hubs. We were putting different uh, arrangements of magnets and Velcro on them to see if we could um, 
guarantee the emergent shape, things like that. Um, so you can, what we've done is we've 3D printed these hubs that go around the weasel ball, and then it just pushes that hub around, and then we can add whatever instrumentation or um, actuation we want on there. Uh, we investigated boxes, pushing boxes around. Uh, this is just an emergent property that's pretty well known. Um, Dylan and Shell and, and collaborators had a really nice paper talking about actually boundary interactions um, and the clustering problem, which was very inspirational to me. Um, so we became very interested and we published, if you want um, to play around with these weasel ball hubs, we have like all of the, the models and the files um, up online. And we've also got some nice gazebo simulations. Um, <clears throat> so uh, moving in a little bit into future work a little early, uh, what I'm really interested in is coming up with a hub that can actually shape shift. And I've got uh, some, some collaborators at Cornell who are also interested in this. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Uh, there's some really interesting theoretical questions like how many discrete shapes uh, of the hub are required to enable just a steady state patrolling. Um, you know, you just drop them in and let them go. And, and can you guarantee that given a certain sensor model, you'll cover the entire environment and, and see everything. Uh, and depending on the environment geometry, how, how many different hub shapes do you need? Um, and then we also talk about sensing modalities, um, filtering, and of course, avoiding getting stuck. So uh, if you have a, a hub shape that's exactly the same geometry as maybe a corner in your space, you might get stuck. Um, can you guarantee that that will never happen? Uh, so there's a lot of interesting things here. And of course, the micro scale robots um, can also do some of the shape shifting in some of the new the new publications that have come out. So I'm very excited about eventually closing this loop and uh, applying some of this at the micro scale as well. But focusing on, you know, not having individual control or sensing or state tracking of each individual agent, but coming up with strategies that are scalable and robust. So um, yeah, I'll talk about uh, what I'm working on now, which is uh, a little bit, uh, I'll give you some background on the Collective Embodied Intelligence Lab. Um, so they are a collection of, of hardware and software geniuses. Um, I have software in terms of soft robots. <laughs> uh, the lab itself has actually two goals. It's not a purely robotics lab. Um, the first goal, um, or they're, they're supposedly equally weighted, but um, we do a lot of work studying biological collectives. So that's honeybees, termites, ants, um, plants even. We're doing some stuff with, with grapevines and some interesting things there. Um, so that includes designing instruments. They've got these backpacks they can put on the bees, which are really, really interesting. Um, so there's a lot of stuff going on uh, with a good, good, healthy respect for the the collectives that are already out there. And Kirsten, of course, did did field work in Africa with the termites and things like that. Um, she's she's an expert at both that and the robotics side of it. So then the other side of that is using what we learn from biological collectives to improve the robustness and scalability of robot collectives. So. This picture here is sort of a spectrum of, of different robot designs. Kirsten's um, PhD work was on these uh, termes robots that could collectively construct an environment. And they were kind of very slow and, and um, communicated through the environment um, very deliberately. And then we've got honeybees, termites. We've got um, a lot of hex bugs with different shaped uh, hubs and looking at how they collectively uh, form shapes. They've got a lot of soft robots um, at many different scales with different designs, um, putting them together in collectives and, and coming up with algorithms to control them. Uh, the ants, of course, are, are really interesting and, and swarming bees. And so this is a kind of a spectrum from uh, of how these systems interact stigmergically. So I'll talk about stigmergy here in a moment, I believe. Yes, uh, so the task and collection of tasks that we focus on in the lab is collective construction. So either trying to collectively construct um, the shape of the collective that you're in. So reconfiguring uh, a collective of robots to maybe form a bridge across a gap or something like that, or 
actually manipulating the environment, the dirt like termites do and, and building something. Um, and then we focus on stigmergy, which if you're not familiar with it, it's a term um, talking about coordination and communication through the environment. So by cha making changes to your environment, you can then communicate with other agents or yourself later um, and using this as a deliberate tactic because we see this all the time with, um, with natural systems and it's very effective. So um, let's see. Yes, Kirsten came up with these figures. Uh, I think this picture on the right, it's a little hard to see, but it's really a project in the lab that I'm really excited about where we're studying how uh, bees swarm. So when, when they have to move locations, the queen goes somewhere and then all of the honeybees are able to follow her even in you know wind and, and over long distances and things. And it ends up that they actually align themselves with the wind and create their own uh, dynamical patterns in the in the air in order to spread their pheromones uh, very efficiently and communicate over long distances. So I think that's just fascinating. So we're looking at everything from, you know, very slow, very intentional um, designed robots to these very fast and turbulent systems. Uh, so uh, when I started in January, I kind of I, I'm the theorist in the lab, so I'm not, I'm not a hardware person, <laughs> uh, but I wanted to jump in on a few hardware projects just to start getting a sense of, of how these systems actually work. So one that I jumped on was with a PhD student named Steven Cerrone. Um, so he developed this um, soft oscillating platform that I just got back from playing with for two weeks. Um, so here's an example of them. Uh, maneuvering in a confined environment. So nothing, this is just sort of a, a pilot video that I took. Um, you'll have to wait to see some of the other experiments, but this is just a, a traveling wave of activation through the collective. And you can see that um, they're doing this, what they call peristaltic motion, um, where these interactions with the environment are actually are latching them in such a way that they're able to robustly move across uh, even though the actual connections between the robots are not that robust, so they tend to detach from each other and then reattach, uh, but they're still able to perform this, this collective motion because of their interactions with the environment. So I think these are really interesting, and I've been doing some, some algorithmic work on them, uh, looking at different uh, ways of of coordinating. Um, in the long term, I think these, these kinds of soft robot collectives are really interesting uh, toward an understanding of epithelial mechanisms, so that's uh, your skin or other biological boundaries uh, in, in the body, uh, like how they form, how they're able to react to disturbances, heal, um, reconfigure. So um, I think they're super interesting uh, and we want to be able to eventually engineer materials that have these kinds of nice properties. Um, the, the soft collectives especially are, are really interesting in constrained environments. So that demo I had just shown you wouldn't be possible if those were hard robots because they're expanding uh, to more than the size of the hallway that they're in, but they're able to, to compliantly react to that and still succeed. Um, so on the algorithmic side, I'm interested in coming up with, with distributed algorithms that are efficient and, and minimal sensing and all that, um, and then coarsely characterizing the collective dynamics and using those in higher level um, task planners. Uh, I'm especially interested in seeing if we can get the collective to actively reconfigure itself so that when the whole collective bumps into a, a, a boundary of its environment, it's able to actually reorient in a, in a predict predict predictable way. <laughs> um, and then we just got this uh, paper on the hardware side published in IROS, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, uh, and then the other hardware project I've been hopping on uh, is with the postdoc I mentioned earlier, Paul Bardunius. So he's a termite uh, expert and termites are incredibly inspiring in terms of what they're able to do. They, they farm, they uh, build these huge mounds, especially the African termites. Um, that have all these different chambers that are better for different, uh, you know, the queen and raising the babies and, and farming their fungus farms and all of that. Um, they're really interesting in the way that they react to different 
uh, heterogeneous environments. They're able to succeed in all different kinds of, of mediums. Uh, they create these sophisticated struggles using local sensing, um, stigma and, and tactile interactions. So part of po why Paul is so cool is because um, in the past, people thought that termites built their mounds through pheromones. So they thought that these were chemically mediated interactions. And it ends up that you can show that they're almost entirely tactile. So it has to do with how the termites, how often they're bumping into each other, how often they're bumping into um, little little deformations in the walls. Um, so they can do almost all of this without any kind of magical, um, complicated pheromone rule set. Um, so he's got a bunch of papers on that if you're interested. Um, what I'm interested in with, with digging robots and, and dirt and soil is the fact that if you have a bunch of lightweight agents moving on the surface of, of dirt or soil, um, and you look at how they move over time, so those, those traces that they put in over time, um, they're going to have different signatures. So like that figure we saw of the micro um, swimmers in different concentrations of, of hydrogen peroxide, they clearly looked different. And you could say, oh, OK, this one that's going really far is clearly in a high concentration area. Um, I think we could do the same thing with dirt. So uh, it, it's much more complicated, though, because these motion signatures are going to depend on your body morphology, your gait, um, how much power you're putting into your gait, um, and of course, the underlying substrate characteristics. So that's what the substrate is made of, um, how wet it is, the humidity, plants, even things like that if you're in a natural environment. Um, so trying to interpret these motion structures. And a lot of this is inspired um, by a line of work by Fei Fei Qian, who's I think now at USC, um, just started as an assistant professor. And her line of work is really, really interesting. She did her, her PhD with Dan Goldman at Georgia Tech. Um, so she's got a lot of really interesting work on understanding how simple robots um, scatter when they reach obstacles in their environment, as well as actually measuring properties of the soil. Um, and they're working down in White Sands National Monument, which is like a big um, dune field, I think the largest sand dune field in, in the US. So um, yeah, I'm hoping to, to contribute something to this line of work, um, probably more along the lines of, of very simple robots. Um, and then on the theoretical side, all of this is going to tie together um, into work that I'm, I'm doing on just characterizing the design space of stigmergic coordination in dynamic environments. So uh, I think if you're not familiar with information spaces and all of that stuff from Steve, I didn't have time to, to give a little tutorial here, but um, information spaces are basically, instead of having your regular configuration space, you um, come up with a space where uh, different states contain the same amounts of information. So different sensor and actuator histories will put you in a certain information state that might be, you know, oh, I'm two feet away from the wall, or it might be, oh, you know, I need to go and give, give this piece of dirt to my friend or something. Um, and it, it's, it's coming out of game theory. So reasoning about how much information is available to you, what you know, what you don't know. Um, and insects, I would say, are, are excellent game theorists. So in a lot of time, in a lot of places, they've solved this problem of, you know, how do you get a collective outcome to occur just by having each individual do whatever makes sense to it in its local frame? Um, so some interesting design features of this problem. Uh, we want to come up with, with simple rules that we can iterate. So um, instead of having each agent keep track of a lot of uh, global state of the environment, you just want to have simple rules, maybe even just reactive rules that it applies when it makes sense, uh, and then see how the iteration of that affects the global state. Um, a lot of the biological systems, especially, you, you see that strategy switching happens at thresholds, whether that's a sensor threshold or, or something a little bit more um, com computational. Um, so instead of adapting your strategy at every time step, you know, doing your optimization problem, <clears throat> you just do the same thing for a long time until uh, something changes and then you switch, switch modes. Uh, so it's much more discrete, uh, much more amenable to, to sort of this high level reasoning that I like to do. Um, and 
another really interesting design feature is you have to work with the under environment's underlying properties. So I talked about the bee swarms, they, they align themselves with the prevailing winds uh, in a way so they're not trying to fight, fight what's going on in the, in the, in the world around them. Um, so that requires some understanding of the environment. Uh, and so, yeah, um, I didn't want to put in a bunch of math here at the end, but I'm working on um, some interesting stuff on quantifying how these changes in the environment um, over time and changes in the environment's dynamics, so the, the dynamics of the dynamics, um, it's a function of, of course, your baseline environment dynamics, so your currents or your flow fields or anything like that. Um, plus whatever agent modifications are happening. So the bees flapping their wings, um, the termites moving dirt, uh, the robots creating a little local electromagnetic field or anything like that. Um, and those agent modifications are dependent on their own internal state and what we call their local view. So they have some local view, some sensors um, that tell them what's going on in their own little local environment. So we're able to actually put all of this into, into the information space framework um, and that's what I'm, I'm most excited about right now, um, because then we can quantify how um, design changes to these agents um, affect the overall dynamics of the environment. So if their local view gets a little bit smaller, or a little bit bigger, or if a little bit noisier, um, if the if the magnitude of their modification changes, so they, you know, the termites able to dig twice as much dirt, how does that change um, the the rate of completion of the mound, things like that. Um, I think we're able to actually uh, start getting a theoretical understanding of all of this um, because a lot of people that have been working with stigmergic systems in robotics, I think it's proven to be a pretty effective tool, but we don't have a good understanding of, of the design space. We just kind of have some intuition. So I'm very excited about um, integrating this with all of the, the good work that's going on with automated design and um, verification, automatic verification, things like that. Um, so I'll conclude by saying uh, Rodney Brooks um, is, you know, a personal hero of mine, but uh, he was in a documentary where he described uh, robotic systems as fast, cheap, and out of control. So this is kind of a novel paradigm at the time where he was saying, okay, we'll take a bunch of robots and, and throw them into space and collect a bunch of data. And it was sort of a a shift in in how people thought about robotics toward what I'm talking about now. But I, I don't actually like this characterization of like fast, cheap, and out of control because, uh, well, it reminds me of like move fast and break things. <laughs> um, but I, I, I like thinking about design in this kind of, in these settings uh, as you want robots that uh, have strategies that are good enough for now and safe enough to try. So um they're able to you know detect something about their local environment make some judgment to put them into a very coarse state of what they think is going on and then they have some strategy that they'll just keep applying until something else happens um so that's that's kind of the intuition of of this design process which is different than traditional engineering um and i'll conclude with three takeaways so if you don't get anything else from this talk um if you're trying to design a system that, that is made up of maybe many small, simple robots, um, it's important to characterize something about the environment. So, so these kinds of robots are never going to be, you know, all purpose. You can put them anywhere and they'll, they'll find a way to succeed. There's going to be some characterization of, of where they're most effective. Um, and it's especially useful from the theoretical side if you're able to come up with equivalence classes over the environment. So um, a big range of states where, where the same strategy can apply. Um, and low fidelity sensors are not always bad. We don't always want more information because that actually makes it more difficult for us to apply this strategy of, we're just going to iterate the same strategy over and over again. Uh, addressing the problem of getting lost or stuck is really important, um, both on a practical level and also because I think it gives you a lot of insights into uh, your solution space uh, if you're able to identify when you're going to fail. Uh, and then, of course, everything is, is task-centered. So figuring out what exactly is the task, what 
exactly are the informational requirements of stating that you've completed that task. Um, and if you start there and you find good task solutions, then I think you start seeing composability. So we, we figured out how to get the bouncing robots from point A to point B, and that led us into the non-deterministic planning, and that led us into multiple robot planning, and, and that's um, how we got the composability. We didn't try to start with, oh, let's get a thousand bouncing robots to go from point A to point B um, under uncertainty. And um, that's that's kind of the design strategy that I take in my work. So that's, uh, that's I've tried to share a lot at a high level here, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, I want to acknowledge my committee who was uh, extremely helpful in allowing me to graduate during the pandemic, which is not easy. <laughs> um, my Bouncing Robots collaborators, um, NSF and Cornell for the funding. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you for having me here. Uh, thank you, Ali, for the great talk. Um, are there any questions from the audience? No question? Maybe in the chat, let me see. But I, I, I do have a comment. Um, <clears throat> I, I really like the idea uh, of the minimalism for robustness in a sense, right? So this is, was one uh, one of the reasons why you were saying that um, you know less is more, right? Uh, but you were saying that um, that may not be the case for self-driving cars and things like that. But why do you say that? One of the things that I, uh, I mean, first of all, I, are you, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, so you know, I think that, you know, one of the problems with the self-driving cars is that we are kind of like, um, you know, the consensus seems to be that we want these cars to be complicated and drive with humans and so on and so forth. But what if you make them drive like robots? You know, use very simple blind strategies that are very well understood and very repeatable instead. Wouldn't that be better rather than have something very sophisticated that you always wonder what the heck is the car going to do? Yeah, no, I think that's a, a great point. Um, I, yeah, I'm definitely thinking about it in terms of if you have a self-driving car that's driving in an urban environment with pedestrians and bicyclists and other human drivers, um, you don't necessarily want to just apply a simple strategy or, or you know, a bouncing strategy would obviously be, be <laughs> yeah. suboptimal. You don't there. want to bounce off kids. Yeah, you don't yeah. want to bounce off kids, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but, 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 but in a sense, you may want to have kids bouncing off it, right? So <laughs> in the sense that, um, that you have maybe a car that maybe doesn't drive fast, drives in a way that is very repeatable, right. uh, very well understood, and then you have children who learn, okay, so that's the car you don't mess with it, right? And uh, you know, just get, you know, stay away from it. But you know, things like that. Right, um, yeah, for sure, you know, the, when the you, best. When, when you have a, like a railroad crossing, you don't go play with it, right? So you just stay away. <laughs> you know, um, right. Yeah, I'm the, the best that, human. You know, there is there is a lot in this uh, robustness for you know minimalism for robustness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it depends on what level of abstraction you're at. So the mm -hmm. the underlying hardware and and state tracking and things might not be minimalist, but the the rule set that the car uses to drive probably should be what you're saying, like very predictable, um, very calm. You know, not doing unexpected. Uh, complicated things right. uh, because then, yeah, the best human drivers are, are very predictable and, and follow a pretty small set of rules in terms of the, the traffic laws and all of that. Um, but I think if you go too far in that direction, then you end up with, you know, just trains again, like, well, it would be simpler if they were just on a track and we knew where they were going to go and uh, then we just have reinvented trains. <laughs> but I think the, the best solution is somewhere in the middle there, yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Emilio. It was a great comment. Um, any other question? <laughs> 
I think I have one uh, out of interest is um, so you you have worked towards minimality in robotics both on the large scale and the micro scale you are saying also when you are thinking about micro scales for the future. Um, what would you say is the biggest uh, scaling effect that appears to be relevant for your studies? Yeah, um, in terms of physical scale, I think the physics at small scales is just completely different. <laughs> um, so we can kind of create a simulation of it with the with the weasel balls, but it's not quite the same. And there's some really interesting physical effects around um, you know, local flow fields, entrainment, things like that, that you could really take advantage of at the small scale that just don't show up at the macro scale. Um, and things like sliding um, and bumping just become so predominant at the small scale in a way that you don't see at the large scale. Um, I saw that with even with the mouse robot, it was most of its um, motion pattern was like drifting, uh, sliding across the floor instead of having no slip contact with the wheels. Um, and so they had to come up with a, a completely different um, trajectory uh, estimation and, and control method for that because they just weren't expecting that. They were expecting, oh, it'll act like a little, a little toy car. Um, so I think, yeah, just you can't make any assumptions about the physics when you scale down. Um, so that's part of why I really hope in the future to be able to actually work with some people who are, are manufacturing and working with these, these small scale systems because I, I make my best guess based on the literature, but you know, there's so much out there that you just can't, uh, you can't guarantee <laughs> based on our intuition at, yes. at large scales. <laughs> Yes, yes. We, we have had some discussions with some groups here at ETH who are doing uh, micro and nano scale robots, mainly mm -hmm. driven with magnetic fields and so on. And you're yeah, right, there yeah. are many interesting uh, things to consider there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know there's a bunch of people at ETH. Um, cool. Thank you very much, Ali. And uh, I guess uh, if people have more questions, can reach out to you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Feel free. Um, if you Google my name, I'm sure you can find my email. I'm happy to correspond with, with people. Um, and yeah, thank you for having me. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you all for participating. See you all next week. Bye.